So, Robert, good morning, my friend. Oh, good, good, evening, evening. good evening, shall I say. Morning here, evening there. So, yeah. how's things with you? Very busy this time of year. In fact, very busy for the last yeah year and a bit now, Ricardo. Yes, I think people, would you agree, people are, are looking to build comfort in the home and get bring good music and enjoy their music. I think that that seems to become a pattern now. I think that's very much the case, yeah. Uh, you know, lifestyle, thinking people are thinking a lot more about lifestyle as an a home orientated lifestyle as opposed to an outdoor lifestyle right now. Well, I'm very honored to be with you here today, uh, Robert. Uh, people ought to know that we've known each other for many years. And um, now that uh, Absolute Sounds uh, as uh, its uh, portfolio of, of good, good and excellent products, we decided to open a, a, a very interesting um, division of the company called Ten. And yeah. uh, Ten will only have, as you know, uh, four or five brands specific to their field, so there'll never be clash or, 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 or conflict. They'll all represent the sum of, um, of their sector. And I'm honored to have you and be working with you for the many years to come with um, the, your fantastic uh, Robert Coder line. So, Robert, tell me a little bit about uh, how did it get to that? Shall we I'll let you wind back so that we can, people can understand that you're just, <laughs> just a new baby? <laughs> <laughs> How far back would you like to go? <laughs> um, yeah, shall we say, when did you start paying so much attention to audio equipment? Well, I think around the age of 11 or 12. Uh, I remember some of the children at school used to, you know, we had the old wooden desks and they, they would scratch their uh, um, their girlfriend's name and or something like that with the, um, a sharp pen or what, whatever they could find. And uh, I, I was, um, if I wrote anything, it would have been something like Rogers or Quad. So <laughs> <laughs> that's very, so very I, wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's a good start for me as well. It started with actually with a gentleman from South Africa, uh, Andre Van de Novo, and we tried to bring the speakers active at the age of eight by connecting the wires into the main sockets. And that was quite an interesting concept. So we, I was already mingling in the early days. But tell me. I, so I, I never knew you, you, you were friends or acquainted with Andre van der Neuvel, But yeah, I mean, that's a, a name, a bit of a blast from the past. But, um, oh, Andre I'm van sure der Neuvel and I were with, um, with Nautilus, you know, running active. Sorry. And they required, uh, uh, you know, the old Nautilus, I think, I'm sure they required about four channels of, of four stereo channels. So eight channels of amplification. So, uh, yeah, he probably got to where he was uh, looking to go. And, uh, <laughs> well, yeah. I, think, I think I've, you know, been lucky enough as well to get to where I am pegged out to go. Because, look, I haven't been... Um, uh, I haven't displayed at CES. I mean, when I was young, and we used to get the uh, the Hi-Fi News magazine was about the only um, audio mag we we could get. I would spend all my pocket money on that because you know the pound was very expensive, and um, you know look at this and oh gee, I wanted to be at CES with my own brand and uh, you know. It, my dreams were oh what am I going to call myself and you always come up with these weird uh, um, Greek goddess names and such like. But that was um, very much uh, um, aspiration from, from a childhood um, time, yeah. Well, I have to say and, you've done extremely well to attract my attention because uh, we, you ought to know, Robert, as we develop this thing with age, we become more and more difficult and demanding. And, and, and the brain doesn't want to have to to make a judgment anymore. And it becomes um, uh, a seek uh, for a feeling. 
and very few components, as you know, are able to generate that feeling. And you're definitely one of them. So can you tell me um, a little bit about, the, shall we say, your history into audio engineering, audio perfection, audio, uh, yes. Can you give us a little bit of history so people understand that you've been around for quite some sure. time? Sure, no. well, well, it all starts with, with, with listening. Uh, and I was very lucky in, in that from an early age, uh, I was really in the uh, retail, high-end audio retail, and uh, I had access to, you know, the kind of kit that, that I could never possibly afford at that time, and and pretty much long-term access as well, you know, take it home for a couple of months, and, and everyone would ask me, well, what do you think of it? And, and if I said it was good, they would keep it as a product. If I said, so, uh, but what was good about that is I started to, to draw common threads between certain amplifiers that produce pleasing uh, um, sonic results um, and occasionally, you know, find ones that, that, although they look promising on paper, were actually not a, not a good listen. And, and, and that is, that's the starting point is trying to figure out what, what is the reason why a specific amplifier sounds better than another amplifier? Uh, often there, there, there are several reasons, but you have to break that down into some kind of technical rationale. Without that, you can't go ahead and design something uh, that at least meets that criteria or, or, or can be better. So, so that's a, you, you know, I, I interrupt you there. there and then, you know, as a teenager, I spent most of my life in uh, what's called the, the AES journals. That's the, the Audio Engineering Society journals. Um, because that, you, you know, had very in-depth white papers and, and uh, um, uh, solidly engineered articles. And then, of course, there was Wireless World and such like. And I used to collect massive files of everything that I found of interest and, you know, read over them hundreds of times and, and, uh, to understand. After that, you know, obviously I, I went on to uh, electronics. That was always um, an interest for me, what was radio and electronics, big interest. But then from my dad's side came the music. So when you put all these together, uh, yeah, obviously the, the, the next step after I had had a, a good innings of, of retail and knew what products were good and, and had an insight as to why they might be good. The next step was to to start to learn about the uh, um, the manufacturing side, yeah. And uh, so that took me out of the retail and uh, starting to work with other audio manufacturers. Yeah. Do you want to name a few or? Well, there was, a, 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 in the beginning, was uh, Audio Note UK down at Brighton Hove, um, which was, you know, a very good experience. And then uh, I really had to work very hard at, at uh, persuading Condesan to uh, uh, take me up under his wing, which he did. He actually came out to the UK, picked me up, and, uh, you know, we went to France and to Italy and... Uh, all the famous concert halls that he, he likes, Toscanini's Garden and, and that kind of thing. And then uh, off to Tokyo for the, the hard labor repay, shall we say. <laughs> that was you know, obviously a big learning curve, especially going into Japan as well, uh, where the whole work ethic is, is very difficult, very different. The whole lifestyle is very different coming from, you know, affluent green uh, um, suburbs and now being, you know, living in a, 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 a what, about 18 square centimeter, sorry, square meter, felt like square centimeter, square meter uh, um, sort of home, one room with no audio system. That was uh, a very tough time. I can, I can well believe it. But obviously it's probably all these, um, uh, create what you've created now, probably all these events. And um, uh, some of the uh, names that you mentioned are respected, but obviously they represent a rather 
older type of technology that falls a bit into the classic uh, world, a bit like classic cars. What is the DNA of Robert Coder? Well, well, firstly, and I think what a lot of people would find quite surprising, uh, having come from the, uh, sort of the vacuum tube tradition where I you know, studied tubes before transistors, actually, and, and always had a bit of a of soft spot um, for the sound that, that some of these amplifiers can produce. But uh, Robert Corder is 100% uh, semiconductor, transistor um, design all of our products all of our current products the very first amplifier um, was a hybrid but really um, I found that there were as lovely as it could be there were there were limitations that simply were part of uh, um, part of the technology that that you could not possibly work around so you know you can get to a certain point which is lovely but if you want to go beyond that then you need to adopt find a new technology um <clears throat> and so i moved into moved into transistors but not with the normal uh take direction that a normal engineer would use with transistors um applying them in a very different way and and again trying to discover what were the issues that was making a lot of people not like uh, the sound of a transistor. What, what was behind the so-called transistor sound? And once you've discovered the technical reasons for that, then you can uh, formulate um, design approaches that avoid those problems. So you can actually, um, under a better expression, you know, have your cake and eat it. Excellent. It is possible. Well, I mean, yes, it's certainly, I have to um, open a parenthesis and say that to the listeners, you know, your products are definitely those products because I'll have to confess a little error of mine many years ago, the first time I had your product, I turned my head around and I said to somebody, what a fantastic valve preamplifier. So uh, <laughs> even myself, we, I got fooled about what we associated to that openness and sweetness of a um, yeah. uh, normal good valve amplification <laughs> was suddenly in a solid state unit. So it even fooled myself. But um, what inspires one of your designs, let's say the, the K15, which is for me a, a state of the art yeah. piece. So what does inspire? Uh, such design for you? Well, I think the first thing is I need something myself. <laughs> you know, I need a really good preamp. And so what, what do you do? There's nothing that um, that attracts me in the um, commercial market where I think, oh, geez, I'd really love one of those. Um, I've always rather felt the, the need to develop it myself. Um, and then when you... You need to push it, you know, it doesn't just come uh, um, right the first time round. You need to work on these things really diligently. But once you um, once you have that and you realize, oh, this is, you know, really good, very nice to, you want to share that with other people. And, and for me, that you know, I would build, a, um, before the brand what was Robert Corder was uh, um, created, I was still building the, the early conceptual prototypes. And when it was good, then I would invite friends around and we would do music listening evenings. And uh, then I realized, well, you know, people are enjoying this and it's, I get motivated when, when other people enjoy it. So I build it for listeners. Yeah, this is so good. Yes, I mean, 10 is about listening as well, you know. And, and artisans, I consider you a, um, you know, like we go down in traditional roads here in London, like Savile Row, and we find all the best uh, uh, tailors that have been there for century, customizing and paying that yeah. extra attention over the ready wear uh, products. And I think Robert Coder, as far as I'm concerned, visually and sonically and, uh, and uh, from a structural, point of view or mechanical engineering reflects that sort of uh, 
attention to extra extra detail and yes and 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 the handmade approach so that's a very interesting so um you you obviously um, created all these phono stages um, preamps a couple of preamps and now i believe you are approaching the market with a a, a fantastic mono statement tell us a little bit about it right k160 well that, <laughs> K160 has actually been uh, a product that has been developed over the last oh, 10 years, I think it took about, from from concept to, to end. Now, at, at that time, 13 years ago, we, we had a K70, which was actually, uh, that amplifier's uh, um, basic design what was developed in 2000. But anyway, it came to, to become a commercial product uh, um, only about 13 years ago. And it was a real problem to figure out a way how to build a better amplifier. Because I did label uh, K70 Amplification's ultimate form. And, uh, you know, I, I felt sincere about that. Um, so it, it was, a, I couldn't easily get my head around how am I going to improve on this? There were certain aspects which could make it perhaps more user friendly. Uh, you know, the, the K70 was in a triple box format. So you had one power supply and then a left and a right mono block. And <laughs> if you like symmetry, uh, symmetry then <laughs> it was always a problem. So, um, you know, to make something more um, room friendly, shall I say, that was an easy decision. Yes, we just make um, a, a pair of mono blocks. But I needed to make it significantly better sonically. Um, and that's required, oddly enough, the removal of the tube stage. But when we started K70, there was no, in my opinion, no better way to, to do the voltage amplification other than with the tube. Then came along K10 and K15, and I had figured out how to get the best uh, um, out of transistors. So now there was some technology ripe, finally that I could implement uh, into the new power amp. And there were a few other twists uh, as well along the way. And, and one of those was to get the efficiency up without compromise. So um, the original amp had a, a maximum efficiency of, of only 25%, which is very low. And um, we've got that now uh, close to, to 50%. But at the same time, uh, actual technical improvements, measurable improvements, as well as, of course, uh, um, you know, sonic improvements. So, yeah, it's it's been a a long walk, shall I say? Well, uh, we all very much looking forward so that people understand, uh, Robert, because I'm I'm very I want people to understand where you fit in the big world of super high end audio. Um, how many K one sixties can uh, any customer in the world to see out of the out of your wonderful, uh, shall we say, factory or workshop? What would you uh, say is? If, I want people to understand that they've got a okay. Okay. Look, 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 it's a, it's a long build. Um, it's a really long, tough build. I do it myself. I test it myself. Um, it runs at least a week in my personal listening room so that I can verify there are no um, anomalies and that it's happy in a, a, you know, a, a whole bunch of different scenarios and home theater setup, um, you know, and more complex setups, not just uh, on a test bench. Anyway, um, I would say all in all, if I were pushed four or five pairs a year. You see, so people have got to understand this is, something you have to be patiently waiting and not uh, rush into the decision that you're going to get one tomorrow. Um, and I, I, I mean, this is a bit what 10 is, is artisans that are going to stay within that envelope because my experience in the past is that if you go too much into lower end, then you have to produce more and then it becomes a little more industrial type of approach. So yeah, yeah. to maintain this uh, ambassadors of music in the world, we need people like you. So um, 
I wanted to ask you, um, how would you descri describe your work and influences? So that's a tricky question, but I'm sure you'll find uh, an answer to it. Yeah, um, I think one of my first influences was uh, was my dad, who always uh, liked um, simplicity, um, liked to avoid excess complexity. And of course, in the uh, um, many amplifiers of the 70s and 80s, in order to get the, uh, the good numbers on the piece of paper, they would make things incredibly complex. You would have uh, a mechanism to to correct for the errors, and then a mechanism to correct for the mechanism that corrected for the errors. And you know, so where where did you draw the line? The first thing for me is, is what I call dynamic simplicity. So it's not just that something is simple; it's simple. It it is simple from a mathematical point of view and very stable. You know, I'm in, I'm inspired by elegance. Um, I like things that you may uh, um, find it. The longer you look at them, the more you appreciate them. Simple lines, not not ostentatious, and practical. Every, everything should be there with purpose. I would agree with all these points so very much, having experience with the product. Now, I have a question. Um, obviously, it was a decision for you to keep the K15 uh, very low in its output. Um, uh, so it's actually a preamp that uh, has a very low output. Could you uh, could you explain <coughs> to try to achieve because it's a bit unique. The preamp is actually, in my opinion, unique apart from obviously passive devices, but uh, yeah. in this in this approach. So could you explain the the listener or the person that's watching? Yeah. Us, and what what yeah. what was the idea behind that? Okay, first I should say the, the preamp is not short an output because it can actually swing over 30 volts RMS, which would, you know, if you just buffered that, that would translate to 100 or so watts into a speaker. Um, but the gain is, is lower it's, than the sorry, normal. Sorry, I should have specified no, no. not the output voltage. Sorry, uh, forgive me. The gain, <laughs> the gain is a lot lower um, than the old norm. And when I'm talking about the old norm, I'm talking about the 80s and, you know, the 90s, uh, where a typical preamplifier would have a gain of, of like approximately 20 dB decibels was the, um, was the average. And then, of course, it was connect up to, connected up to a tuner with an output of a few hundred millivolts. So you needed um, a fair amount of, of gain. Uh, with modern sources, and that includes phone stages, you actually find that most of the time you are using negative gain. So if you look at the uh, um, the front panel of a K15, it has a a, um, a, a dial around the uh, um, the knob and the volume control, and that dial is actually um, labeled in decibels. And those decibels are throughput. So it's what is coming out relative to what is going in in terms of, of gain. And you will notice that normally the volume control is sitting midway, 12 o'clock. Yes. Which is actually minus 20 decibel. Actually minus 20. So most of the time, I mean, you can take a source and plug it straight into your, your, your power amplifier and you'll find uh, most of the time it's incredibly loud. You know, and that's a gain of zero dB. So we have a, a gain of eight decibel, and that's really just to accommodate. Um, some formats are recorded and usually low and level these days, um, certain SACD and uh, um, DVD audio for multi-channel uh, media that gets remixed down into stereo often needs a bit of extra gain. So um, eight decibel. And I think a couple of other manufacturers have, um, have cottoned on to this that you know, the old 20 dB was way in excess. It normally meant that you had your volume control actually attenuating by 40, you know, to get to the minus 20. When you had plus 20, you have to attenuate by 40 dB and then boost it by 20. It's just not making too much sense. But there are a few other brands. Um, Pass springs to mind. Audio Research. They uh, The new crop, yeah, they all um, roughly... 
between six and 12 decibel. Okay, well, but uh, I mean, I, I, I consider, I mean, because I'm a layman and all people know that the only thing I've got ears and a heart and they connect well together when a component is good. But I think that I tend to find a tremendous quality in that, uh, shall we say, so-called uh, mid-game uh, uh, pre-amplifier. And I think that some of the purity comes through, perhaps because of that. Yeah, Ricardo, um, you can design a low-gain pre-amplifier uh, that will outperform, in terms of measurements, a high-gain pre-amplifier quite easily. Well, by um, comparatively speaking, yeah. But also bearing in mind that it's drive. The preamplifier needs to have drive. So it has uh, drive. That it definitely uh, is. It's something uh, you could rephrase it as power gain. Correct. And Correct. that's that, that's that's not actually specified in anyone's uh, uh, tech, technical documentation. But uh, power gain, power gain is something. Uh, important to look at, and uh, our preamplifiers, of course, offer plenty of that. Lifestyle has changed. So, um, would you say that it's fair to say to people, please look at this beautiful world of a super high end and maybe shift your investments towards creating yourself a huge pleasure at home? Would you say that's a, a, a good roadmap for the future? I think it is, um, but perhaps more than just home, we should think about family as well. Correct. So, and also sharing things with family, particularly music. I've always felt that a music system should be a central part of a home. It's, you know, sit there with your wife and, and listen to, to music together. Let your, let your son and your daughter come and, uh, and listen as well. They can learn. It doesn't need to be classical. It, it can be anything. You know, son can teach dad a few things too. The actual yeah. soothing, relaxing, uh, refocus or resetting of the mindset that music can help you achieve in the home. And one you, of you the, know, I, one of I the, just remember. Yeah. Sorry, Ricardo. I remember a customer, and, and uh, this made me feel, you know, what I'm doing is, is worthwhile. And he didn't buy anything of mine. I wasn't a company yet. I was just, you know, doing the, the selling a good system, selling and setting up a good system because those two issues together are required. You can't just, you know, have good kit. You need people who know how to set it up properly. But anyway, this, this particular customer who is a, a, a lawyer under a lot of pressure he said, you know, Robert, the, this system has brought years to my life. Wow, that's a beautiful compliment. Well, yeah. I'm so, very much encouraging as well on my side of the world, people to really appreciate what pleasure they can bring. And I'm no longer, this business, come and listen. I, I, of course, I understand that the yeah. first act is listening. But if it is just listening, that's not good enough for me. It's gotta, I gotta feel it. I gotta have that <laughs> feeling that I'm, you know, the something is communicating with my whole uh, chemistry. So, um, uh, and, and, and very few components uh, do that. And I think that I can, uh, it's not to flatter you, I think your line of, of electronics do that extremely well. You represent to the world a, a super high end. Um, uh, the ideal type of constructor, uh, which is somebody that uh, makes components for a purpose that is music, and then not just makes them to prove yourself that you're a great engineer, because that's not the end game. Prove that you're a great engineer, that's, that's never achieved any, any results, in my humble opinion, in, uh, in audio. You have to have that drive to say, I want the pleasure of listening to it. Yeah, if I could just think of perhaps the first time you heard um, Super Tramp or something like that. And, you know, when you were young um, or uh, the first time you heard Avalon and the, the, the impact that that had. And then in the last, you know, following years, it's never been the same, yeah? 
it's never had that that freshness. And we want to get back to that where, where you listen to this. Wow. You know, wow. It's like listening again for the first time, you know, uh, re-experiencing uh, the complete freshness and excitement of it. So, you, you know, that, that is a major drive for and us. Not only that, I mean, we talk about Super Trump, but we could turn the clock back a little more. The great classics of the 50s jazz American scene and which flourish right. and ramifications are all around the world. And uh, Thelonious Monk, Pat Jones, uh, Miles Davis, uh, all these people. And I think that these components that are now available to, to people are a way to bring that music, that heritage back into the home as well. And, and I think this is phenomenal. This is almost better than bringing old black and white movies back into the home. It's a, it's a feeling. So um, I have a, a question here. I don't know if it fits in this part of the interview or should I be up in front? But what is the project that made you the biggest pride of all the history of uh, Robert Coder? The one that really you said, wow, this is, I'm achieving, I'm getting somewhere. I would say K10. I, I tell you why is because K70 was the first product and now the challenge is to see can you can you do it again? Because it's more difficult to be consistently, you know, on top of things. Okay. Doing a, a one hit wonder is, is one thing, but you know if you can spin off a, a couple of, of, of great um, great products, I'm very proud of K10 because it's lovely to use, magnificent sound. Um, it's not the most expensive, but it was my of our within our range. But it was my first preamplifier, and it's also just so elegant, electrically speaking. I'm very proud of K10. Would it be able to carry that message for many years to come? Um, as you know now, uh, you probably noticed uh, some of the more luxurious magazines are now. I saw one last Sunday that suggested mm. that high-end audio is now like officially part of the luxury world. So um, many good years to come with uh, good manufacturers like yourself and which have integrity, of course, because as you know, there are some out there that just go for price points and I would advise the consumer to be wary of those. Yours really yeah. reflect I think they reflect the value is high, uh, the end value, but it does justify it with all the efforts that and the time you put into them. You know, I mean, time is uh, is uh, crucial. I mean, uh, well, it's it, yeah. uh, like the one in the K15 would cost yeah. to ask somebody to build it, and I was I was shocked, and I can tell people we're talking about thousands of pounds just in in build quality and value and value. So uh, yeah. congratulations, yeah. this is taking super high end to another level. Yeah, it, it, it's a strong mix uh, of, of very exotic uh, custom built parts and done in very low volumes, with, which, you know, obviously uh, in, almost ensures that they, they're not cheap to manufacture, but time and... Uh, we're very proud of you, part of ten. So we, um, uh, may I finish with this on a on a music note? Uh, how much music do you reckon you put in a week? Three, four albums a night. Wow, bravo! This is it. Well, yeah, for me, if I don't do it for three days, I've got like withdrawal symptoms, you know. But I want to say a big hello to you and your family in Japan. And all we'll right, thank you soon here back in the UK when all this this things opens up again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. You know, if I have to go to a board for a show or something, I really just cannot wait to get home. Um, and and looking very much forward to uh, to seeing you and obviously to hearing uh, um, some of our kits uh, in, in your system. Well, we're waiting for the amps now, but. Uh, we're very much enjoying the preamp at the moment. <laughs> yeah, glad you like it and, and 
Thanks for your words. Oh, Thanks and for your a lot kind of people, well, a few, a few, because it's always going to be a few will uh, obviously have the option to own one shortly. So thank you very much. Uh, yeah, no, I'm going to, I'm going to say walk off the vinyl now. Okay, take care. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.